what we're witnessing right now, especially in Europe, but other countries as well, is what is called in economics the tragedy of the commons. That's a situation in which, as you know, with fisheries, everyone wants to catch the fish. If I don't catch the fish, somebody else will. And if there's no property rights to limit or exclude people, everyone has an incentive to overfish. If you go to the Philippines, you can see it in a very stark way, the destruction of much of the fisheries of the Philippines because of overfishing. The fishermen go out and they fish with dynamite. They toss a dynamite stick into the water, it explodes. The fish are stunned by this. They float to the surface and you can easily catch them. You could try this any time at the local municipal swimming pool. You would see exactly the same thing happen. Or they pour in bleach, and the bleach asphyxiates the fish, who again float to the surface. But here's the big problem. It kills the coral reef. Coral is a living organism. When the coral reef dies, no more fish. So you ask the fishermen, why do you do this? Do you not know that this is killing the coral reef? They know. They're not stupid. It's been explained to them quite well. Why do you keep doing this? And the answer is always the same. If I don't catch the fish, Someone else will. There'll be no fish for me at all. Someone else is going to come and catch them. But now we face much the same problem with the welfare state. If I don't go and qualify for that government subsidy, my taxes aren't going down. Somebody else is going to get it. So each one of us has an incentive to go and get what we can from the government in subsidies and special favors and income. Because if I don't collect it, it's not that it's just going to be uncollected. Someone else is going to get it and I'm still going to end up paying for theirs. So we have a tragedy of the commons now with the welfare state, but it's worse than with fish. The resource we are overusing to exhaustion is each other. Everyone is busy robbing everyone else. And each time we get our little piece, we think, oh, that's great, I got my subsidy. But add up all the subsidies you paid to everyone else. It's much greater for most people than what they're receiving in return. And we have pushed this in many countries, especially in Europe, to exhaustion. Now, thinking about it as a political system, though, let's go back to one of the great fashion models of all time who designed the welfare state. And that is a man known as Otto von Bismarck in one of his more <clears throat> alluring costumes here, as he liked to appear in public with his pickelhaube. He was known as the Iron Chancellor. He unified Germany. He said, not as the liberals wanted, with petitions and referendums and ballots, but with Eisen und Blut, iron and blood, through war. And he fashioned the modern militaristic Germany. He wanted to engage in what we today call nation building or state building, to make people loyal to the German Empire as such, not to their local principalities or local communities as they were before, loyal to the German state. Militarism, all those things came with it, control of the state educational system, propaganda, but also the welfare state, creating systems in which you would be dependent on the state. And he was very explicit about this. We want the German people dependent on the state, to look to the state for their salvation. Instead of having what we today would call an individually capitalized retirement account or a superannuation system in which you set aside your own money and save it for your own retirement, no, the money was going to come into the state and the state would dispense. As he said, just as a soldier is loyal to the emperor because he receives a pension for his service to the state, every worker will be loyal to the state because they will receive a pension from the state. The German liberals, liberal in the more Australian sense, not the American sense, but the German liberals criticized and they said, you will make the German people into slaves, slaves of the state. You will make of us helots. Well, that was the point. That was exactly the point of it, to create dependency on the state. And it was a remarkably successful program. Now, we can contrast two different kinds of extreme statism, we might say. First was the socialist image, the socialist dream, that we would realize human freedom, as Marx put it, as a species being, as a collectivity, 
by being in charge of our own future. That's the Marxist image of freedom. That when we plan our own destiny collectively, we will be truly free. And for this, any price could be paid. It didn't matter how many millions had to be exterminated because the true freedom was the freedom of the collectivity. And the mere individual was nothing, could be destroyed, because the individual wasn't real. What was real was the collective. The individual is a mere manifestation of the collective. And true freedom is to consciously plan the economy, society, science, and so on, into the future. It didn't turn out that well, it was a total failure, that vision, outside of a few academic departments, is dead. We have another one that's more modest, the welfare state. It doesn't say we're going to plan all of society. We're not going to abolish the market economy totally. We're going to allow people to own property and have businesses. But the state will now be responsible for your well-being and welfare. It will lift from your shoulders your personal responsibility for making decisions about health care or education or retirement. The state will liberate you from that. The state is now going to be responsible for your well-being and will create organs of state administration to provide these. And these vary widely across the world. In some cases, the state was responsible for housing. Think of council housing in the UK and other countries. Austria had a great deal of state housing produced by the Gemeinde, the uh, local state administration. It might be medical care that's fairly common, some cases totally monopolized, in some cases the state has only a half provision, like in the United States, about half of all expenditures on medical care are through the state, or other activities that will be response, the state will take responsibility for those. So it's a more modest vision than the socialist one. But let's think about how it's structured and how it has worked. How were these welfare schemes structured? The first principle that's common all around the world was designed by Bismarck, a very clever man. It's called the pay-as-you-go principle. That is to say, money is paid into a state plan, whether it's for medical care or uh, retirement, and that money is paid out to current recipients. The idea being that those who are currently paying in will receive the money paid in by the next cohort of people who will move into the labor force and pay. Those tend to be very popular at the initial stages. Think about the American social security system, for example. When it was first structured as a pay-as-you-go system, it was pretty popular. There were many people, actually not many, but there were some people who received retirement payments without ever having paid anything in at all. They liked that. That seemed like a very attractive arrangement to them. It wasn't such a huge percentage of the population. There was a sense we can afford this. Huge bulk of the population paying in, small numbers receiving. And then that money was, we were told, put into a trust fund in a little town in West Virginia. It's a piece of paper that says, I owe you $16 trillion. So that's the Social Security trust fund, the investment. That money was paid. And indeed, the system went cash negative in the year 2010. In other words, more money being paid out than was being paid in. And it is getting worse every single day. It's broke. So in the early phases, these systems are very popular, but they reach the mature phase after the politician has long since retired or died. And it's left now for later generations to deal with. The other one is fiscal illusion. And this is a common feature of understanding how states are financed. Every politician wants to show you the benefit of what they offer, beautiful, gorgeous thing. And the cost is somehow hidden. And there are lots of mechanisms to hide the cost. Think about tax systems that are so complicated, you can't really tell how much you're paying for it. Well, in this case, a lovely one, also introduced by Bismarck, and a common feature around much of the world, is the so-called employee share and the employer share. When I pay my Social Security tax, I receive my wage statement, employee share of Social Security tax. It doesn't mention the employer share, which matches it. But in fact, as any labor economist will tell you, 
100% of that came out of my pocket. There is no employer share. It's money the employer was willing to pay to hire me, and instead of coming into my pocket, it went into the government's pocket. If I pay someone $500 to paint my house, I'm not really interested in whether it went into the church collection plate or into the pokies. This is not interesting to me. I'm willing to pay $500 to hire a house painter. The employer is willing to pay that much money. And if the government designates some of it, so-called employer contribution to retirement, it's not causing the employer to pay more. That's the key. So this system, and there are a whole range of schemes to hide the real cost from the, the taxpayer. And then finally, these are characterized ideologically as social rights. It's your right to receive them. It's your social right. It's about solidarity and fairness to receive these benefits from the state. And also, you paid into it for 35 years. Of course it's your right. The mere fact that when we broke open the penny piggy bank, there was nothing in it is irrelevant. We've got to go find the money someplace. 